I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, this is Barbara Starley. She is an author, a best-selling author, not just an author, a best-selling author, and she is a QuickBooks Pro advisor. Um, she is the founder of Good Steward Church Academy. You may want to check that out when you get a chance. And her contact information is there. We're going to share that later on in the chat. Barbara, thank you so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak with um, this TechSoup organization. It's so great for all of my clients. I also want to introduce really quickly, um, Paige Hudson Garcia is going to be on the back end of the Q&A. So if you have a longer question, feel free to um, put your uh, questions there. Um, otherwise, as um, Aretha said, be sure to put them in the chat so I can see them as well. And then Bill Sims, he's the behind the scene guys for everything related to QuickBooks Made Easy. And I am so appreciative to have them both on uh, the, the call today. So thank you, uh, team. Um, really quickly, most of you are probably pretty familiar with um, Zoom. If you need to make uh, Zoom bigger, um, you can move your mouse around, find that view icon in the top right corner and select full screen so that you can uh, see your screen. Okay, um, we do a lot of QuickBooks Made Easy. I'm gonna kind of skip through this. We're gonna go through these at the end um, and also give you some opportunities to learn more about my House of Worship training that I did um, in conjunction with QuickBooks Made Easy and some of the other promotions that we have. But we have so much to cover. Um, as a matter of fact, I uh, did this presentation in my Good Steward Church Academy as a trial run on Monday. And um, I'm like, it, it goes really fast. So if I talk too fast, I, I'm going to apologize in advance um, for that. Okay. Um, what we're going to do today, um, we're, these are the uh, six main things we're going to cover. First of all, just classification of workers, kind of a general look at that. Who can be clergy? What does this dual status thing mean? Um, we're going to talk about housing allowances. Uh, we're going to talk about reporting clergy compensation and um, some common misconceptions that I hear over and over as I work with churches. So um, but before we do that, I want to do a quick poll. And Bill, I'm going to have you go ahead and um, put this poll up. I want to know what your role at your house of worship is. So are you, are you the clergy? Are you the um, treasurer, a member? Um, in the leadership team, bookkeeper, outside bookkeeper, or other. So we'll go ahead and have you all answer that question. And I think this um, qualifies for CPE. Do we know that or not? I don't know if it, if it does or not, now that I think about that, to be able to answer that question. Awesome. Okay, well, we have... Um, yeah, good, good variety of people here. Thank you so much for answering that poll. And do I have to hit share results? You got it. All right. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to our uh, first uh, topic here is the classification of workers. And I do this on purpose because we're going to talk about the dual status, but if you don't know what the two statuses are, um, it can get a little confusing. So let's just go through real quickly. Um, the, there are two main types of workers in a house of worship. Technically, there's three. Uh, there's volunteers as well. But when we're talking about the classification of workers, we're talking about employees and non-employees. Okay, so the difference between these two, and this is kind of a good checklist for you all um, to keep, um, to for you to make that determination when you are bringing a new person on board. So the employee works for the house of worship. The house of worship hires and can fire that employee. There's usually some kind of an employment, employment agreement or job description. Um, the house of worship controls the schedule, tells you what time to show up, what you're supposed to do. Um, you have a lot of, um, you might have training and supervision for the work that you do. The house of worship provides the facilities the equipment, the tools, think um, audiovisual, right? On um, During your services, that type of thing. Um, the House of Worship reimburses for expenses, generally. Um, if you do something um, like maybe you drive over to Costco to pick up, you know, goldfish for the kiddos and uh, you're gonna probably get reimbursed for that, right? The House of Worship determines pay rates and schedule. And um, you're generally entitled to 
uh, benefits as an employee, assuming that you qualify based on your number of hours, that type of thing. A non-employee, on the other hand, has their own business. They're considered in business for themselves. They offer their services to the public. They should have a contractual agreement to you rather than an employment agreement. The non-employee controls their own schedule. They know what and how to do the work, and actually they can hire someone else to do the work. So um, you can think of like an accounting firm as a non employee to you, right? But they, it might not be the person that you talk with initially, they may have um, a bookkeeper under that account that's actually doing the day to day work. Um, non employee provides their own tools, they pay their own expenses, they have potential to make a profit or risk of loss. In other words, they're not going to get reimbursed um, by anyone but their own company. Um, the non employee determines pricing and should be invoicing you for the work that is being done as a non employee and they should provide their own insurance coverage. I will tell you that work comp insurance has gotten very smart though. They're realizing that um, organizations are not necessarily putting these, uh, to putting their people in the right camp. And so their um, work comp insurance, a lot of times will say, if you can't provide a certificate of insurance for your non-employees, then we're gonna, we're gonna have you pay the um, premium on your non-employee compensation as well. So just kind of keep that in mind. But this is a good checklist as you're going through and bring, um, bringing on new people, good to know the difference between the two. And really the key factor comes down to control. Who decides how much you're gonna make? Um, who is uh, controlling your time? And what relationship do you have? So if you're thinking, if you ask somebody, um, well, who do you work for? And they say the name of your house of worship, they're probably an employee, right? <laughs> Okay, so um, having said that, uh, there's really two forms that we use. Employees, are re the reporting of their income is on a Form W-2, and the reporting for a non-employee is on a 1099 NEC. I think one of the best things that the IRS has ever done in terms of forms is to separate the um, non-employee compensation away from the 1099 miscellaneous, and that's all that you're really reporting on the 1099 NEC. So I think that's um, important to know how you would report that. So I give you this information because um, bef we're gonna, again, we're gonna talk about the dual status, but before we do that, let's talk about who can actually be considered clergy in your house of worship. So first of all, they need to be licensed, ordained or commissioned by a church or a denomination. They need to be considered a common law employee of the religious body, again, church or denomination, and they need to perform ministerial duties. And when we talk about ministerial duties, we're talking about, whoops, went a little bit fast on that, <laughs> that they administer the sacerdotal duties. In other words, they administer the sacrament. So they, um, they might do communion or mass, um, they might do uh, baptisms, they might do weddings, funerals, those types of things that are considered sacraments in your denomination or church. Um, they conduct religious service. So you can think about the lead pastor, could actually even be the worship minister. Um, they, they may be considered a minister. They might even have re management responsibilities. They're, in other words, they're controlling or conducting the maintenance of the church. So you might have a pastor of church administration um, and that they are considered a religious leader by your church or denomination. So um, these are the things that are required in order for your clergy to be considered, um, in order for your employee to be considered a uh, clergy. So why is being clergy even important? Well, it's important for several reasons. One, the classification of being a clergy determines how that person will file their tax return for income tax and for social security and Medicare purposes. Secondly, they actually have a potential double benefit of being able to deduct um, as an itemized deduction their mortgage interest and their real estate taxes and also exclude that same money that they get on their, um, on their housing allowance, right, as housing expenses. So it's kind of like they get double dip. They're not taxed on the money they get from the church and they get to still deduct it 
um, if they meet the qualifications on the um, itemized deductions. In other words, if they meet the threshold. Of course, we all know that the IRS like raise that threshold um, really high. So some people don't even itemize, but if but they have that potential. Um, they're exempt from mandatory income tax withholding. In other words, they don't have to have income tax withheld. However, they can voluntarily ask the organization to withhold income taxes to cover their federal income tax and SECA taxes. So we're going to talk about um, these a lot as we go through the rest of the session. Um, their housing allowance is excluded from income taxes. That's important. And the exemption from self-employment taxes can be done on a very limited circumstances. So a couple um, extra things on this slide. One is I put an asterisk, asterisk next to the word is because um, there are exceptions to whether your housing allowance is in fact excluded. We're going to talk about that. Um, and actually these four um, little boxes we're going to talk about as we go through this session. So if you have questions on these, um, hold those questions. We'll probably cover them as we go through. These are really important. Okay, so what does dual status really mean? So we know there's an employee and we know there's a non-employee, right? So what the IRS says is that the, um, that the clergy has the status of an employee for income tax purposes, but they have the status of self-employed for social security and Medicare purposes. So when we are looking at, an, at a clergy, then we have to sit there and think, well, you just told me that employees are gonna get a W-2 and a non-employee is going to get a 1099 NEC. So which form do you think the clergy should use? So I'm gonna go ahead and have Bill pop up the um, poll for which form do you think the clergy should receive? Should they get a W-2? Should they get a 1099 NEC? Should they get both? Maybe a W-2 for the salary and a 1099 for the housing? Either one works, it doesn't really matter. They're dual status and so you can decide or you have no clue. <laughs> and don't worry, if you have no clue, that's fine because we're gonna find out. Excellent, good job. All right, thank you everybody for answering. You guys are like right on it. I love that. Thank you so much. All right. So the majority of you said W-2 and you are exactly right. The um, the pastor, the, the clergy um, does in fact um, get a form uh, W-2. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. Let's stop sharing. Excellent. Thanks so much for answering that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and move on now to housing allowances and um, and talk about uh, how what those are all about. So let's see there. Okay, um, before we do that though, I want you to consider when, and this, this is something that I've seen happen um, in many of the houses of worship that I work with. I want you to think about clergy compensation as a pie, right? So you have kind of a salary piece of their compensation. You have the housing piece of the compensation and you have a benefits piece of the compensation. So when you're thinking about paying your clergy, it's a really good idea to think about it this way. So your sal the salary portion is gonna be includable in the taxable income for both income tax and SE or SECA tax. The housing is excluded from federal income tax and most states, but not all, Pennsylvania being one of them. And, um, but it is subject to seek a tax. So it's not technically tax free money, right? It's just that you have the ability to not have to pay income tax on that housing, unless you have an exception. And then your benefits um, may be taxable may be taxable for both income tax and SE tax. We're gonna talk about some of the things that you might be thinking, oh, well, we can do that and it's not gonna be taxable income and it really maybe should be. So we're gonna talk about a lot of that. All right, so um, the IRS, actually, I'm gonna read this just word for word. This comes right off of the IRS website that says a clergy's housing allowance, sometimes called a parsonage allowance or a rental allowance is excludable from gross income for 
income tax purposes, but not excludable for self-employment tax purposes. So there's a great thing to just remember. And um, so I just thought I would give you that quote right there. Okay, so let's talk about the housing piece of the pie, okay? So, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about kind of the time frame of all of this as well. But first of all, this is one concept that a lot of people don't even realize that is out there. Housing allowances need to be approved by your board based on the lesser of three. So let's talk about the three. First of all, actual expenses. So um, you can, the clergy can estimate their actual expenses, which would include their mortgage principal and interest, real estate taxes, renters or home insurance, um, your home, your HOA fees are included in that, utilities, repairs, yard maintenance, not your cleaning person that comes into your home, but the yard maintenance can actually be included as part of your actual expenses, furniture, appliances, even a down payment in the year of purchase. However, the um, I will say that because it's the lesser of three, there's a good chance that you would not be able to take that as um, non-taxable. Uh, income just because of the lesser of three. So let's talk about the other two. So you have actual expenses. Second one is the fair rental value. So you're, you live in a home and um, the fair rental value, if it was furnished plus utilities is considered the fair rental value. Numbers the lesser of the two, of those two. And then there's finally a third um, possible uh, limitation to the housing amount. And that would be if the board designates either a sp specific dollar amount or a percentage of income. So I have had houses of worship where the board has said, we don't think that it's um, being a good steward from the clergy's perspective to have housing expenses more than let's say 40% of their income. And therefore we are not going to approve anything over 40%. So it could be one of these three that is gonna determine how much housing allowance gets approved by the board. So one of the best things that you can do actually is have some kind of a housing allowance worksheet. The clergy would fill out this top portion up here with their actual, when I say actual expenses, estimated expenses, right? what they um, believe are gonna be their actual expenses. And then it is incumbent upon the leadership team or your board that they, that they do these second sections. Like, first of all, do they have a limit? That's pretty easy, either a dollar or percentage, but also to find out what the fair rental value of that home is. So a couple, um, couple things. First of all, you can actually download this housing allowance worksheet for free at um, the Good Steward Church Academy .com and use this uh, coupon code at checkout. You can get this form for free. But here are some suggestions when it comes to um, using this housing allowance worksheet. First of all, uh, there we go. The document approval needs to be in writing. Okay, that's why a housing allowance worksheet is so valuable because not only does it um, have have the process, have the clergy go through the process of estimating theirs and then prove that the uh, leadership team has gone through the process of figuring out the lesser of three. It also gives a place for them to sign the form and date the form. So I think that's really important. Um, secondly, um, this particular housing worksheet says for the tax return year, and it has a blank there, but Honestly, a better uh, way to do this is to include a safe harbor clause so that you can continue that allowance beyond this year. Okay, so what we're saying there is that um, you could put in the on the uh, housing on your housing allowance worksheet. You could say this amount will remain in effect until it's changed or, or superseded by a new form. Okay, so that um, you don't have. In other words, you you as a house of worship do not have to get a new housing allowance every year if you have that safe harbor clause. So that's a, I mean, that can be a real time saver if things kind of pretty much have stayed the same year over year for the, for the clergy. Um, 
one thing that I always advise to people that call me and ask me questions about pastor payroll or clergy pay, um, clergy payroll is, um, hey, my clergy asked me this question and I'm not sure how to answer it. And I just, I'm going to advise you if you're in that situation, unless you're their tax preparer, um, you probably don't want to become their tax advisor, right? They're, that is really not your position and it really is up to the clergy to um, get the information that they need personally. Um, another thing is that um, one of the easiest ways, you might be sitting there thinking, well, okay, I got the, um, I understand the estimated actual expenses and I understand the board um, designated amount but how am I ever going to find out the fair rental value? Well, a great thing to do is befriend a realtor, and you probably have one in your congregation that could give you that information and um, give you a good estimate for that. And again, it's it's important for you to protect your house of worship to do this step so that you can make that um, determination. And then finally, be sure to sign and date the form and record it in the board minutes Oh, and of course, you might want to let your whoever's doing your payroll know what you decided, right? So really important. This is a really um, great form to have on hand um, and to use as you determine that lesser of three. So a couple of reminders specifically about housing allowances is that um, housing allowances must be formally designated and approved in advance. Again, that form, signing it and dating it is crucial to being able to prove that in fact it was done in advance. It cannot be established, applied, or changed retroactively. So if you are, um, if you if you give if you decide that you're going to give your clergy a form every single year and they don't change that form until April, or you don't have a board meeting, let's say in January, and then you don't get that approved before that payday, um, that first payday, it is not going to change until, and it can't, and you can't change it back either um, until that approval is made. So that's why it's really important for the person that's doing the payroll to, to have something in hand to say, yes, this has been approved and this is the date that it is supposed to become effective. And again, if that's safe, with a safe harbor clause, um, that's really important. The other thing is, which is kind of an interesting thing is you, is the whole idea that you can't apply retroactively. So if, if you're sitting here in, um, let's say in April and you have just spent a whole bunch of stuff that you go, oh shoot, I didn't include that, um, all those expenses on my estimate, then um, you, can't, you can't change it and say, oh, I'm gonna pick that up for the stuff I've already paid for. But if instead, but if you say, well, I'm gonna do, um, some major repairs in my home, and I'm going to do that in July, and it's April, that's being in advance. So you can actually go to your house of worship and say, hey, I need to change my um, piece of my pie that um, I'm using for housing and get that approved in advance so that you can include those expenses. Um, by the way, clergy can request to change their housing allowance as many times as your house of worship will allow. So hopefully that's not a lot because that's a pain for the person doing the payroll, um, but you just can't do it retroactively. Um, and I do want to make this point because I saw this happen in one of the houses of worship that I worked with. The, um, the, one of the pastors was actually also doing the payroll and I, it wasn't intentional, but what had happened was they moved into a new home. Um, their housing expenses were going to go up and uh, they, petition to the board to get an increase in the housing allowance. But instead of saying, oh, the piece of my pie, which is housing allowance um, is getting bigger and therefore my salary portion is getting smaller, they just gave themselves a bigger piece of, a, a bigger pie. And so essentially they gave themselves a raise, which was not the intention of the board. The board was saying, yes, that piece, it can be bigger, but then your salary piece needs to go smaller. And unfortunately, the time that I caught it, it was a third time he had gone and gotten an increase. So there, the salary had already gotten, or his total compensation, I should say, the total compensation had gotten larger than what they had actually anticipated. So just so you know that. Uh, keep that in mind. 
All right, so um, I said that there were actually exceptions um, to whether you can actually take the whole housing allowance um, and have it excluded from income taxes. So this is how it's written by the IRS. Again, it says, if your housing allowance exceeds the lesser of reasonable compensation, fair rental value of the home, or your actual expenses directly relating to providing the home, then you must include the amount of the excess in income, okay? So just by the way, um, the pastor does not have to tell the bookkeeper or payroll clerk that they uh, didn't spend all the housing allowance. That's They do not have to report that back to the church, right? Or your house of worship. Um, they simply need to add any excess to their form 1040 on, on the first line. So a pro tip for y'all that are um, that are clergy or maybe an idea for you who are doing bookkeeping um, and helping your clergy is to just say, hey, we can direct deposit. I'm assuming you have a payroll service that you could do direct deposit. You could have the um, clergy have their um, housing allowance direct deposited into a completely separate checking account. And then the clergy will pay all of their qualified housing expenses out of that account. So let's think about it. If they're if they keep running short, they could re, they could immediately say, "Hey, I need obviously I didn't estimate this very well, and as long as it doesn't exceed the lesser of the three, they could request an increase." Um, as, for a housing allowance, again, making the piece of pie a little bit bigger. Or, and the other part of doing it this way, and this is why it's such a great pro tip, is that if you have excess funds at the end of the year, you know you didn't spend it all, right? So um, one would be, well, why don't we go ahead and spend it? That would be one way so you don't have to uh, report the excess funds. Um, or simply um, saying that you're going to do the... Uh, you're going to add that excess to line one of the form 1040. I see that I have a thing here. Um, okay, so Tamara says, we have an elder board to approve these as well as the appropriate form to have at least two elders from that board to sign that they have agreed to that change. We then keep a signed copy in the clergy file for any questions later. I don't report to the payroll until I have that form and it remains in effect until the new one has been presented to me. Excellent. That is a great um, internal control. Not only does it protect the house of worship, but it protects the, the clergy as well to make sure that all of that is done. Um, the question from Susan, any rules about which board can approve the housing allowance or does it need to be a full congregation or parish council or board of elders? Excellent question. Um, it all depends on the organization of your house of worship. So if you're a congregational um, a, a congregational church and everything is voted on, um, then you probably have to have the congregation vote. But I would say most of the, even in the congregational churches, most of that, um, they're, they might vote on the compensation high, but they don't necessarily deal with the other. Because first of all, it's hard to explain, right? They're going to have to go, well, why, why is it limited to the lesser of three? And somebody's going to have to explain all that. But generally, it is, um, it's based on each house of worship independently. So excellent questions. Um, okay. All right. So let's see. Let's go on. So, um, so that was one of the little things that I started. I wanted to make sure I told you about that. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's ultimately the clergy's responsibility to calculate and report any excess housing allowance. This is really important. And that's why that pro tip of keeping it as completely separate and using that completely separate account only for qualified housing expenses can be a really, really, really great deal. Okay, so I did include this flow chart and I, um, this is new this year because I, I just thought this kind of shows you all the green stuff as it relates to the clergy and the orange boxes relate to the house of worship. So step one is the clergy needs to calculate um, his or her expected housing expenses. The clergy requests the housing allowance from the house of worship. And then the house of worship, whoops, sorry, I need to click on that. 
Um, the House of Worship designates the official housing allowance based on the lesser of three. Then the housing, um, the House of Worship adjusts the pieces of the compensation pie that we talked about and pays the clergy accordingly. Um, then the clergy, now it's back in their court, they need to track their housing expenses throughout the year. At the end of the year, the House of Worship has to inform the clergy of the amount that they gave them towards the housing allowance. And the um, and then finally, sorry, the clergy um, files their tax return and includes um, the housing allowance on their schedule SE. And I'm going to show you that form in a second. And includes any excess housing allowance as taxable W-2 income, not taxable W-2 so much as that is, but it's going to show up on the same line where your W-2 income is on uh, the form 1040. Okay. Ooh, this is a lot, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully you're um, tracking with me. I'm not getting a lot of questions in, in the chat, so that's good. I, and I know Paige is probably handling a lot of the um, bigger questions on the back end. So excellent. Glad to know that um, you're here. If you have anything be, um, else that you want to add, be sure to put it in the chat or the Q&A. All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, report. Uh, we're going to talk about how do you report. So now you know about housing, you know about the compensation, but how do we actually report the clergy compensation? And we already talked about that we know, and based on the poll, most of you already knew that the that we are going to report um, all clergy compensation on the W-2. So um, it's gonna, this is what it's going to look like. First of all, um, I told you that I would talk to uh, mention that uh, clergy are actually exempt from mandatory income tax withholding. So they don't have to have income tax withheld. And we're going to talk about how they're going to pay their taxes. So just that you know, that uh, line, that box two might be completely empty. Okay. Um, the let's see. box one is where we're going to report total compensation, not including housing allowance. I actually had one of my houses of worship decided they wanted to do something fancy in the payroll, in the QuickBooks online payroll system. And instead of using the, uh, the item, the payroll item that was available to them, they decided to make their own payroll and all the housing ended up in box one. We had to amend, not only did it um, at the end of the year, they realized that, wait a minute, why is all of the uh, money that was paid to the uh, to clergy, why was that appearing in box one? And that's what we determined had happened. But we also had to amend their quarterly tax reports because because they had not used uh, the, the feature that was uh, built into QuickBooks, they ended up um, reporting it wrong. So we had to amend a whole thing. It was, and it um, was kind of like, of course, the um, clergy were like, you know, What's going to happen, you know, but we amended their returns and, and um, all was well. But at the end of the day, we have to be really careful um, how this turns out. So boxes three, four, five, and six should be either left blank or they should be zero for clergy. There's no Social Security wages. There's no Medicare wages. There's no Social Security tax withheld ever. And there's no Medicare tax withheld ever for a um, for a clergy. And um, and then the box, right? uh, box 14, um, best practice is actually to report housing in box 14. This is an informational box only, um, but it makes it so easy to just say, hey, the housing amount was, let's say $18,000, right? Um, now you've given the clergy the appropriate um, information that they need to determine whether they have access, right? So it's best protection for the church um, to do that by, by having it right in box 14. I've had some houses where we don't want to put it on the W-2 because the IRS is going to see this. Um, in that case, the alternative would be to put that amount in writing to the clergy in a separate document and have the clergy sign off that they got that information. Because if they were in a situation where they got audited, you don't want them coming back and say, well, you never told me how much I got in housing allowance, okay? Um, box 16 is generally the same as box one, so for federal, except if your state taxes the housing, 
So just so you know that. Um, and again, I know Pennsylvania, they tax the whole entire amount. Okay, so what's included in box one income? Some of this is gonna be like, you're gonna go, well, of course it would be, right? Um, for example, salary and bonuses, of course. You would expect that that would be in box one of the W-2. Cash and gift cards, this is one that comes up often where they're like, well, we just gave, you know, our clergy, actually any employee, by the way, this refers to any employee, a gift card that needs to be included as income. The IRS is very uh, clear about that. Any cash or cash equivalents, that's why I also said gift cards. Reimbursed FICA or any kind of personal um, expense, including personal insurance, is considered taxable income. Um, as our clergy ages and they um, get to the point that they are able to take Medicare, for example, a lot of clergy will say to the um, House of Worship, hey, you know, it's going to be cheaper if you just pay my um, Medicare supplement premiums than for me to stay on group insurance. So um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hop off of group insurance and um, I just want you to reimburse me for personal Medicare. You can't do that. That is considered taxable. I know mean, you can do that. But you just have to include it in box one um, in terms of uh, taxable income. And uh, another thing that I see happen in houses of worship is where they say, well, you know, we kind of feel bad. Any other um, employee in our house of worship, we would pay half of their Social Security and Medicare, which is true. <laughs> um, so we we kind of feel like we kind of want to give, we kind of want to do that for our clergy. And that's, I, that's fine, but you include, you have to include that in box one. So now you're paying the social security and Medicare on what you thought was the salary. And now you've just increased the W2 income. So it kind of is like a snowball. Well, then it's going to be more social security and there's going to be more, right? So um, best practice is just to understand that the IRS um, put it this way and that, it's their responsibility to pay for SECA. They're getting a huge benefit by not paying income tax on their housing allowance. So um, you, just so that you know that you can't reimburse, reimbursements are for church expenses. If you drive to the Costco and get goldfish for the kiddos, that's a reimbursement for a church expense. But reimbursing for personal um, taxes or insurance is not considered a reimbursement. Non-accountable allowances, this one comes up a lot where um, you say, well, my clergy has a discretionary fund. Um, he or she doesn't have to tell me how they spend the money. They just um, they just can spend the money any way they want. They don't have to account for it. Um, some houses of worship do an auto allowance, flat amount um, every month. They don't have to account for that. They use their vehicle for any particular purpose. All of that is considered taxable income in box one. Moving expenses, I added this because um, this is in the past, you could um, pay for moving expenses, but that is new as of several years ago now. But you can imagine um, how this could have been abused. And I'm sure it was abused, which is why the IRS changed that rule uh, where you, know, you have a, a house of worship in Hawaii and you say, oh, well, we need a pastor. And then you pay for the housing expenses, don't report it anywhere. And then the for whatever reason, that person doesn't actually become a pastor. So they just don't do that. Any moving expenses are considered taxable. And then um, clergy appreciation and love offerings. These come up often. I think October is generally considered clergy appreciation month. Um, and so you're collecting, you might collect a special offering for your clergy. Um, I recommend that you do a designated fund for that so that you know exactly how much was um, collected, but that amount does need to go on the W-2 in box one. So um, if you're not familiar with my fund buckets methodology, um, it's kind of a game changer for most of my houses of worship. And I do have a polling question for this. So I'm going to go ahead and have Bill put this up. Does your house of worship collect designated and or restricted funds? Um, your uh, options are no, yes, we have a few, yes, we have a bunch, or Yes, we have way too many. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thanks for answering that. 
Yeah, most, I would say most of my houses of worship have at least a few, you know, something like uh, benevolence, for example, is a good kind of designated fund. Um, by the way, benevolence benefits can't also cannot be paid to employees or clergy and be tax free. Those are only for somebody kind of coming in off the street, if you will, um, that, you know, says my electricity is going to be turned off if you don't pay my electric bill and the um, house of worship has to vet that and then um, they may pay that electric bill directly, but a, an employee cannot benefit that way. So great. Thank you for um, answering that. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let me check the chat here really quick. Um, let's see. Are you saying that you do not withhold Social Security and Medicare? Absolutely. Yes, you do not withhold Social Security and Medicare. That is one of the um, one of the most important parts of clergy payroll is that the clergy is responsible for paying for Social Security under what's called SICA, self-employment. And so um, you do that on your own personal tax return and you do both sides of the that um, of those taxes. Um, a question from Tammy, our clergy is paid as part-time. Um, that person has a full-time secular job. When filing taxes, they're considered as self-employed because of the housing allowance in box 14. Therefore, they pay higher taxes even on the secular jobs wages. Can you tell me why? Okay, so, all right, so you have, so you have a, this is the situation. Clergy has two separate jobs on the side of the employing house of worship, that clergy is going to have no social security or Medicare withheld and um, the house of worship does not match that social security and Medicare at all. And if it's part-time, they might not even hit the threshold to have federal income tax, but they're never, but as clergy, as we said earlier, is never subject to having to have taxes withheld. They're, if they're in a secular job, all bets are off for that type of employment. They're treated just like any other employee. They can't, they're not, in other words, they're not a pastor if they're working in a secular job for that employing unit, right? So if they're in a secular job, it's gonna be like, they're gonna be treated just like any other employee. But um, we are gonna talk about some different ways that they can make sure that they're taken care of in terms of their, their taxes. So um, therefore they pay higher taxes, yeah. Um, they probably would pay more um, on, as far as the secular job because they're having Social Security taken out, they're um, having Medicare taken out, um, and depending on the gross, they, they might have in, um, additional uh, federal and state as well. Okay, so here are some common misconceptions. I'm just checking my time here. Uh, some common misconceptions um, about clergy tax. There's really three of them that come up over and over in my conversations with my houses of worship. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you the three and then we're gonna talk about each one indiv individually, okay? So the first one, this is a common misconception, is that churches can pay or reimburse for clergy's FICA. And that is not true they can increase compensation um but they cannot and they can reimburse but it all goes back onto as part of the salary so that moves into that uh salary piece so it becomes taxable um second one actually i'm going to go through these first three and then i'll go through with the details okay the second mis common misconception is that clergy cannot have any taxes withheld that's a misconception i'll talk about that and the third thing is that the clergy must file a form 4361. Otherwise, Social Security and Medicare taxes will be withheld. So these are common um, uh, situations that come up and it's, it's a conversation that we have to have because a lot of times there's confusion around this. So let's start with the first one. The first one is that churches can pay or reimburse clergy's FICA. So I'm kind of feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but reimbursements are always considered additional compensation to the clergy and they show up on in box one of the W-2. Clergy must pay SICA taxes personally. 
And the way that they do that is by using a form called a self-employment tax form or a Schedule SE. That's why they're sometimes referred to as SE taxes. So they would um, uh, re use this form in conjunction with their 1040 um, form. And just by the way, if they have access housing, it would just get added. You just kind of write in access housing and gets added to whatever W-2 wages they may have outside of either within the church or if they have a secular job in addition to that, or if they have a spouse that works, right? That would all be on that line. But this is the form that they use to calculate their taxes. And by the way, it doesn't actually come out to exactly double um, SC taxes, which is another reason why um, we don't really have to uh, worry that much. One, they're not, it's not the full 15.3% that, um, that's both sides of Social Security and Medicare. And, um, and it, yeah, it's just, it, it's just, it works out okay. They all, again, that housing is not subject to any federal income tax, so it's still generally a benefit to them. Okay, again, what's included in box one, uh, we're, uh, what we're talking about here is if you reimburse, you have to put it on the W-2. So just so you know that. Okay, so that goes back to that one. The second common misconception is that clergy cannot have any taxes withheld. Okay, um, they're not, they don't have to have taxes withheld. They're, it's not mandatory, but if they have no withholdings, then it's up to the clergy to make quarterly estimated tax payments. Okay, but good news, the clergy can have extra federal withholding tax um, taken out of their check to cover their federal income tax and both sides of Social Security and Medicare or their SECA tax. So they can request that from their uh, church or from their house of worship. And let me just, um, let me go back. But just so that you know this, any taxes that they have withheld are gonna be taken out as federal withholding tax. They're gonna appear in box two of the W-2 Never, ever, ever, even if they're saying, well, I want you to take out taxes to cover my SECA taxes, they still don't show up in boxes three, four, five, and six. So it talks about estimated taxes. Estimated taxes are paid quarterly. However, if you've ever actually looked at the dates on the estimated tax forms, they're a little wacky. So the first quarter taxes are due April 15th. The next quarter taxes, you'd kind of think would be July 15th. But I think the IRS just does this to confuse us. They say, no, no, that quarter is only two months later, June 15th. So if you miss that June 15th deadline, you're actually late. September 15th, um, you would think, well, no, the end of a quarter would be September 30th. Why don't I have until October 15th? But no, no, you have to do it. You have to pay that quarterly on September 15th. And then at the end of the year, they go, well, we know that you might end up having getting a year on bonus or something. So We'll give you till January 15th to pay that fourth quarter. But it gets a little confusing because if you're thinking, oh, I need to do these and they need to be equal, you only have, you have, you know, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. They're just kind of weird dates. Um, if instead, though, you said, I don't want to deal with any of that. I, I can, I calculated last year, I owed this amount in taxes based on my 2023 tax return, and therefore I'm going to give my um, house of Worship, a Form W-4, yes, clergy can fill one of these out. And this line down here, this is extra withholding per pay period. They can say, hey, last year I owed $3,600 and I want $300 coming out every month out of my paycheck. And that amount, whatever that extra amount is, will end up showing up in box two. This is a great option for um, clergy that don't want to have to deal with the quarterlies. Um, so again, this was one of the points that I made earlier that they can voluntarily withhold income taxes, income taxes to cover their federal income tax as well as their SECA taxes. Okay. But again, still nothing shows up in boxes three, four, five, and six. And states also have a similar form that will allow clergy to say, well, I want to have state taxes withheld. So, um, this is a great option for people that, um, especially, um, new clergy that, you know, they kind of go that through that first year and 
and then they kind of have sticker shock when they do their tax return is a great option for them to say, hey, I'm going to, I don't want to have that happen again next April, but I don't want to deal with the quarterlies um, to just have the House of Worship withhold for them. All right. So um, the third option or the third common misconception about clergy taxes is that the clergy must file a form 4361, otherwise social security and Medicare tax will be withheld. Okay, let's explain the form 4361. First of all, the form has no bearing on withholding. Social security and Medicare are never ever withheld from a clergy's payroll check. They can't say, hey, could you do that for me? Because it's gonna be easier. Nope. If they're clergy, they can't have Social Security and Medicare withheld. They must file their tax under the SE rules. The Form 4361 is not about withholding actually at all. It's about the conscientious objection to the acceptance of public insurance. It cannot be filed for economic reasons and it is irrevocable. So I'm gonna um, go to that whole 4361, but before I do that, I'm gonna hop over to the chat and just see a couple of questions. Um, Let's see, for clarification, if clergy requests voluntary federal withholding, then the church would make the payment along with their 941. Yes, exactly, Mary, that was a great question. Yes, they, they're they gonna withhold it. It's gonna show up in box two. And yes, it's part of um, your regular uh, um, uh, tax deposit <laughs> that you make with the IRS, that's correct. And to the state, if you if they elect that. Um, we. Will we receive a copy? Oh, yes, you will receive a copy of this presentation. Um, I know Aretha said that you'll get a copy of the slides so that you have those. Is there a minimum extra withholding amount to not have to make estimated payments? Um, no, there's not a minimum. Um, but if you if you've done your tax return and you set and your um, if you did your tax return last year and you know that your total taxes were let's say six thousand dollars total, right, your SECA taxes and your federal taxes. And now you're going, okay, well, I can do either 2000 quarterly, um, I guess it wouldn't be right, $1,500 quarterly, or I can just have my uh, house of worship take out that 6000 divided by however many paychecks you get, that might be a better option, right? So it, there's not a minimum. All right. Um, let's, let's see, takeaways from the meeting. Um, use provided checklist. Yep. Consider work comp. Yep. And, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a, a good, uh, all of this is really good. There's lots of good resources. Okay. So, um, all right, let's talk about this form 4361 because it is a little confusing and some people have, um, don't look at it, don't, don't realize what it really is. So the form 4361 looks like this. Um, this is the, this is saying I want to be exempt from SE tax and is only available under very limited circumstances. First of all, you cannot opt out for economic reasons. You can't fill out this form and go, well, I don't like the way the IRS handles Social Security and Medicare, and therefore I'm going to use this 4361. That's not a, um, a, a reason to fill this out. Um, you're not going to, and you're not signing that. You're not saying that, right? This form also creates an irrevocable election between clergy and the IRS. So when you do this, you want to do it um, with full knowledge. So I do, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on this, but I do want to make sure you understand. First of all, when you file, or if you decide to file Form 4361, you are certifying that you are conscientiously opposed to the acceptance, not to the payment, but the acceptance of any public insurance that makes payments in the event of death, disability, old age, or retirement, or that makes payments toward the cost of or provides services for medical care. If you read that again, you realize that, that what they're talking about is you are saying you're conscientiously opposed to accepting Social Security and Medicare, right? That's one of the public insurance. There's lots of other public insurance that the... Um, government provides, but that's essentially what you're certifying. If you can honestly say that, then you can file this form 4361 within a certain time period, and you need to inform your church or licensing body of the church of your conscientious opposition. Let's think about that. 
the reason that they want you to tell and inform the board or the leadership team of your conscientious opposition is they don't want you, one, they want to hold you accountable that you can actually say that, and hopefully they do, and two, they don't want you coming back later and saying, I don't have enough money in retirement, and now they you become a benevolence issue for the church or the house of worship. Okay, once you've um, certified, you've filed that form, <clears throat> you've informed your board, the IRS will come back to you and say, are you sure under penalties of perjury that you can verify your grounds for exemption are that you're conscientiously opposed to the acceptance of public insurance? And then if you do re-verify that, then you, do, then you can receive an approved copy. So I went to a, a conference last week and he, um, there was a person that was there from a financial uh, financial planner. He said, I have worked with thousands, thousands of clergy over the last however many years he's been a financial planner. He said, I have only seen two, two cases out of thousands that the clergy actually did what they needed to do to make up for the loss of their social security, not, not the loss of their social security and Medicare if they qualify, but that is so much lower to make up for the diff for that amount that they didn't have being paid in for them. So it's really, really, really important um, that you know, understand the ramifications of that. Um, I talked to a, um, one um, person just this past week and she said that was the worst decision we ever made because they never made up for it on their own. Okay, so the common misconceptions again, um, churches can pay or reimburse clergy FICA, but it becomes income. Clergy can have taxes withheld. They just have to file that W-4 and say, I want extra withholding as federal withholding tax to cover all of their taxes. And clergy, um, the 4361 has nothing to do with having Social Security or Medicare taxes withheld. Um, that it, you, um, clergy never have Social Security and Social Security and Medicare taxes withheld. So those are common misconceptions. Here are some useful resources, the Minister's Audit Guide. This is right um, available on the IRS site, as well as the publication 517. I just mentioned those in case you want um, something to help you go to sleep at night. <laughs> and then I do want to um, invite you to check out my Good Steward Church Academy. Um, we took this one session and we actually did it over a three week period. We spent about three hours on all of these different parts, the, the compensation, the housing allowance and the 4361. So um, there's a lot to this and I know I, I um, gave it to you really, really, really fast, but um, I invite you to check out my site. Um, and then we do have a webinar coming up on QuickBooks for Houses of Worship. Um, it's gonna be a webinar series, one for the desktop, uh, one for online users. And um, there's a link in the chat if you want to grab that. And then um, also just to mention, there is a downloadable uh, streaming training that um, we can get a discount on that. That's available on the QuickBooks Made Easy site, as well as tech support. And here's the thing. I love working with Houses of Worship. I believe it's my calling. Um, you can read about the, my history and how I believe I was called to this purpose in life and um, on my website. But um, if you, you if you uh, sign up for tech support and you are a house of worship, you can ask for me specifically, but most of the time they'll give you to me anyway because they know that that's my passion. So um, really quickly, um, we'd love to have you subscribe to our monthly quick tips newsletter. And uh, Bill is gonna put that in the, um, in the uh, chat as well. Pastor says, can you please put up the IRS website back up? Yes. Yeah. This one I think is the one that you wanted. And um, you will get a copy of this slide as well. Hopefully that's the one that you were asking about. And let's see, I think that is it. Um, I want to thank you for being here. How did I do? Wow. Right at the top of the hour. Whew. All right. I'm excited about that. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate it. And um, and I'm glad that you got a lot of, yes, there's a lot of information given in a very quick amount of time. So thank, but thank you for your kind comment. Appreciate that. Anything else? Any other questions? Paige, do you have anything that um, came in on the Q&A that I did not answer? I 
thank you, everybody. Nope, this it's all fun. good. It was a great session. Oh. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for being there and answering the questions on the back end. I know that's really important. All right. Um, Aretha, you want to come back on and um, close us out? I was just going to close out. I'll let you see all the thank yous and the hand claps and the thumbs up. <laughs> so great job. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care, everybody. I see you too. Oh, everybody. Where is the survey? When you close your window, the survey will pop up. Oh, okay. So stop my share. No, oh, um, somebody oh, asked oh, in the Q and A the survey, and then Bobby gotcha. says, "Is this covered in the paid three day training?" Um, no, we do not cover this in the three day training because um, there's so much more to cover about just how to use QuickBooks, and not everybody is using um QuickBooks payroll. So we do not cover this there. And by the way, if you do have an outside payroll service, don't just expect them to know this stuff. A lot of payroll companies are, you know, they scratch their head. What do you mean that person doesn't have to have Social Security and Medicare withheld? So if you are working with a payroll service that doesn't understand this stuff, um, please either get with me um, that I can help you explain it or um, find another payroll service. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody, you take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you again, Barbara. Thanks. Bye.